please join me in the prayer for illumination printed in the bulletin. Let's pray. Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you so that the whole world may witness our union and give glory to your name. Amen. Alrighty, we are picking up right where we left off last week in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. Um, I will be reading from a different version today. I'll be reading from Eugene Peterson's adaptation called The Message. All right, here we go. Mark 9, 38 through 50. John spoke up, teacher, we saw a man using your name to expel demons, and we stopped him because he wasn't in our group. Jesus wasn't pleased. Don't stop him. No one can use my name to do something good and powerful and in the next breath slam me. If he's not an enemy, he's an ally. Why, anyone by just giving you a cup of water in my name is on our side. Count on it that God will notice. On the other hand, if you give one of these simple childlike believers a hard time, bullying or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. You'd be better off dropped in the middle of a lake with a millstone around your neck. If your hand or your foot gets in God's way, chop it off and throw it away. You're better off maimed or lame and alive than the proud owner of two hands and two feet, godless in a furnace of eternal fire. And if your eye distracts you from God, pull it out and throw it away. You're better off one-eyed and alive than exercising your 2020 vision from inside the fire of hell. Everyone's going through a refining fire sooner or later, but you'll be well preserved, protected from the eternal flames. Be preservatives yourselves. Preserve the peace. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Sometimes, what the gospel records Jesus saying is difficult to hear. Sometimes because we just don't understand what he's talking about, and the translation takes the Greek and rearranges words, and it, things, they, they try to smooth it out for English, but sometimes you can't because what the Greek has that makes sense in the Greek, which we don't speak, just can't be translated smoothly into English. And so sometimes we're left scratching our heads when we hear some of the things Jesus says in the Gospels. Other times we hear things that make us squirm. And if we're people who don't deal well with gore, we might feel a little queasy. And today's passage is one of those examples. <clears throat> Here, we have chopping off of hands and feet and tearing out eyes, being drowned by a heavy stone and tied around one's neck. This does not sound like our beloved and loving savior who goes to great lengths to seek and find the lost. Cut it out, Jesus, you're grossing everyone out and scaring off the chickens. However, if we are going to take scripture seriously as Jesus' disciples, then we need to stay in our seats, grit our teeth, and try to understand why this passage is here. In reading some commentary about this passage today, I came across something uh, from Christian Century, written by a woman named Nanette Sawyer, who is the associate pastor at Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago. And she says about this passage, the shock is the point. We read these words and strong emotions rise up in us. Jesus is essentially throwing a glass of water into the faces of the disciples. Wake up, 
Take notice. This is serious. Cut it out, Jesus says to his disciples. Well, what are we to cut out, Jesus? We are to cut out our so very human tendency to make and to place stumbling blocks. Mark shows us in, in Mark's gospel frequently that the disciples just don't get what Jesus is doing. Last week's gospel passage shows him holding a child in his arms, teaching them about true greatness, to seek humility, not superiority, to be the servant of all, not the first. And we have to assume they got something out of that. Who doesn't learn where children are involved? Then, right at the beginning of the selection for today, we see that if they did receive any wisdom from that teaching, it didn't penetrate very far because they run up with this breathless report of someone else doing exactly what they should be doing, casting out demons in Jesus' name. And by informing on this anonymous person to Jesus, they're showcasing their arrogance. Someone else is casting out demons, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us, says the New Revised Standard Version. And note the phrasing, not following us. Not not following you, not following us. This is a perfect illustration of Christian hubris. The disciples equate following Jesus with following us. If they're not with us, they must be against us. Cut it out, Jesus says. Don't stop him. No one can use my name to do something good and powerful and in the next breath slam me. If he's not an enemy, he's an ally. Why would anyone, by just giving you a cup of water in my name, is on your side? Count on it. God will notice. Elizabeth Meyer, who blogs at Salt, says, Quit the infighting, Jesus says. Stop with the elitism. Cut out the arrogance. You're setting a terrible example for each other, for the crowds, and especially for newer disciples, younger ones in the faith. Remember, he was holding a child in his arms, and it's a good bet he still was. So stop the finger pointing and start getting your own house in order or else your hypocrisy will cause the little ones to stumble. Little ones like this child. Yes, or like the stranger you mention, the one casting out demons in my name. The Common English Bible translation gives this section of scripture the heading, Recognize Your Allies. This past week, uh, I began with some uh, 42 other minister members of National Capital Presbytery, some mandatory training uh, that uh, could have had this passage as its, as its foundation. Uh, given the unrest last summer after George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis um, and how so many people were more upset by the rioting than by the fact that a man was murdered, uh, the leadership of our presbytery began planning for a way to unlearn and relearn what it means to be an ally in our day and age. Vocabulary.com defines ally as someone who is on your side. Uh, for example, like a more experienced teammate who is your ally in convincing the coach to give you some more playing time so you can develop experience. It benefits you both. Ally comes from the Latin word allegare, which means to bind to. Like the nations who might be at war, they act together and protect one another with the common goal of defeating an enemy. 
in the training that we had this week, we looked at how being an ally is an important step towards moving out of the morass of divisiveness in which our world is mired, particularly our country. The ally shift was aimed specifically at racial divisions, but our wonderful and energetic leader from Service Never Sleeps, a young woman named Whitney Parnell, showed us that divisions exist along a wide spectrum of differences. And one of the first steps to get unstuck from this morass in which we find ourselves is to identify the differences. Yeah, really, identify them. See how we as individuals are different from other individuals around us. And don't say, I don't see color. Yes, you do see color. If you don't see color, then you're not seeing or you're not capable of seeing. The point is seeing color and not reacting defensively to color, to gender, to gender identity, to physical ability, to age, to social status, and any other kind of division that we can draw between human beings. This was a very challenging six hours. It was two days of three hours apiece. And we continue next month and then on into, into November. This was, it was challenging and it will continue for us as minister members. If you're interested in hearing more about it, I can give you some more information. It was really worth it, very much worth it. And it gives me a sense of hope that there is a way out of this. We can move beyond screaming at one another over a vast chasm. As far as seeing fellow disciples are concerned, Jesus uses some vivid hyperbole to illustrate how we are to see each other. Jesus sees this other person as an ally. He's doing what I want you to do. Don't cut him out. He seems to say to us in this particular passage that threats to our own discipleship, our own walk with Jesus, don't come from anything outside of us. They come from within. My hand, my foot, my eye is the source of my difficulty. Not the disciple walking beside me on the road, much less another group of disciples or people who are even of another religion or race or class. It's me. Also, Jesus hyperbole underscores the stakes of what it means to follow him. Gehenna, the word translated in our reading as the a furnace of eternal fire in this passage, was a smoldering city dump just outside of Jerusalem where trash was gathered, tossed into a big pit, and burned. And since there's always trash, there's always fire. Jesus' teaching about following him into the new world he is bringing into being is clear. Infighting, elitism, arrogance, they are formidable, self-destructive dangers, and so we should continually guard against them, rooting them out if necessary with vigilance and resolve. Cut it out or be in the fire. Caroline Lewis, who blogs at Working Preacher, says it's about following. When you truly follow Jesus, your eyes aren't on yourself or the person next to you or the people around you because you and the person next to you don't matter. The person you are following does. And that, has a claim, that person has a claim on how you see yourself and how you see the other. Think about it in terms of being in the army. What do they do in boot camp? They beat the ego out of you, and they make you see the person next to you as vital to you because you are following the orders of your commander. That's how a military unit moves. And there are so many vets who say, yeah, I served with people I never would have gone up to on the street, but they're my brothers and sisters in arms. Carolyn Lewis says, when we truly see what is in front of us, Jesus, what Jesus does, who Jesus is, 
and isn't, then the chances for stumbling blocks diminish, and we start to see that Jesus is beyond our best efforts to limit, sideline, abscond, or silence one another. When we see Jesus, we understand who our allies are. When we see Jesus, we understand what it takes to become an ally, particularly to someone whose very being is a threat to the power structure some hold on to at the risk of throwing everything away for all of us. We may think this passage is about condemnation. Cut it out, Jesus says. But what it's about is about reality our reality of how we live together. It's about what human beings do. We exclude, we judge, we condemn, we compare, and too often we consider ourselves God's keepers. The truth is we're called to be God's generous and welcoming hosts, hosts who throw the doors of the kingdom open wide to follow Jesus is to expand our circle again and again and again and again, just like Jesus did. So what about that thing about salt at the end of the passage? The, the message says preserve. Uh, Eugene Peterson was, was using the idea of salt as a preservative. Other scriptures, uh, other translations use the word be salt. Salt was a preservative, which is what Eugene Peterson is talking about in his translation. It was a preservative in the ancient world, and sometimes it was added to the sacrifices offered in the temple in order to help purify them. Because salt, if you've ever had a cut, or any kind of an open wound and you stick your hands in something that's salty, ooh, it, it, it acts as an antiseptic, stings. So that would help purify sometimes the meat that was offered. So the poetic idea here about being salt is that by the grace of God, anything a disciple undergoes, any trial, any hardship, a disciple undergoes, including the trial of self-discipline, learning how to become an ally, will ultimately have a seasoning, preservative, refining effect. It's gonna burn off all the bad stuff and leave what's good. We're to have genuine peace with one another as the goal. Our humility, service, hospitality, and self-discipline as we follow Jesus are our tools to get to the goal of peace with one another. Jesus wants disciples to cut it out with the barriers. We are to learn to be at peace with one another and ultimately model that peaceful way of life for everyone to be able to see, including that little child Jesus is holding in his arms. Thanks be to God, and amen.